Rachel Birkbeck. I'm one of the criticalists here. Um, did my residency at the RVC and then joined the Ralph. Like I was locuming for quite a while, but joined full time about a year ago. I love working here. It's great. Um, and I spent a lot of time. I spent about three months in primary care practice, sort of doing like day day clinic stuff um, and then moved mainly into out of hours so I've kind of got a bit of experience where you guys have been like on the front line and stuff so hopefully some of this will be really applicable to you um, and I'm gonna like ask some questions and hopefully it can be a little bit interactive as well um, yeah and thanks for like the good turnout I think um, Neuro had a, a series recently and there weren't as many people which I think tells us a few things one of which is that respiratory uh, distress is really scary and like we all find it a bit worrying um, and secondly is just that ECC is better than Neuro which I think is fair um, so I'm gonna just start with um, I'm gonna like go straight in with some really um, hardcore physiology but we're gonna like back off from that in a bit so um, First of all, I just wanted to remind you of like why oxygen is important and why we need it. So this is going to be like back in vet school and, and uni days. But essentially, um, we have a number of ways of producing energy. Um, but in the cytoplasm initially, we can have glucose converted to pyruvate, which produces some NAD and NADH which then feeds into the Krebs cycle. If you've kind of got, which I'm sure many of you'll know, if you've got anaerobic respiration, then through um, conversion to lactate, you can make a little bit of energy, but not so much. Um, and then within the Krebs cycle, um, essentially the main focus of that is to produce a little bit more um, NAD, um, NADH, which can then be fed into the electron transport chain, which occurs in the inner part of the mitochondria. Um, and this is the real like powerhouse. This is where you get amplification of production of ATP. Um, and so just kind of moving on to that quickly. So how it happens is essentially through moving along these different sort of components of the electron transport chain, we end up having a, a gradient where there's mostly hydrogen ions inside the intermembrane space. And then at the end, I kind of visualize it like, you know, like one of those water wheels that's in a river. I don't know what that's called, like a turbine or something. I don't know. Um, but when the hydrogen eventually moves down its concentration gradient, it spins that ATP synthase and basically produces ATP. Um, but in order for all of these sort of electrons to move across and there needs to be a concentration gradient from an area where there's more electrons to an area where there's lower electrons, so they sort of tumble along. And to achieve that, we need oxygen. So oxygen essentially will scavenge some of those electrons to help you create that concentration gradient. So that's why oxygen is so important because we can't produce ATP without it. Um, and essentially the reason why we need ATP um, is all the cells of our body have got this sodium potassium ATPase um, transport channel, okay? So I know you all know this, but we've got mostly intracellularly, there's um, the predominant ion is, is um, potassium and then extracellularly is sodium. Um, and that concentration gradient is maintained because we need to produce action potentials. So there's gonna be no movement unless when gates and channels open, things can move up and down and create your action potential. So in a resting membrane state, we need to have a depolarized cell. Um, and the way we achieve that is by pumping sodium from a low concentration within your cell to a high concentration outside your cell. So against its concentration gradient, so it wouldn't normally want to do that. And that requires energy. Um, so without energy produced through the electron transport chain and, you know, utilising oxygen, none of these channels will work. And when they don't work, we can't produce action potentials. And also the cell then becomes really leaky. It loses its in integrity um, and you die. So brief summary of why oxygen is so important. Um, on a cellular level, we need it to maintain these sodium potassium ATPase pumps that are on every single cell. So little quiz. Um, does anybody know like what, how you would define shock? Anyone got any thoughts on that? Don't be embarrassed, like just throw out answers, it's fine, honestly. Vasoconstriction? Yeah, so you might see vasoconstriction. Why might that happen? Anyone else got any ideas? Think about the patients you see in practice and you're like, you might describe them as being in shock. What kind of things are going on for them? Yeah, drop in blood pressure, but like what, so what's the blood carrying and like why is that important? Oxygen. Yeah, exactly, there we go, it's a talk on oxygen. So, um, so these, unfortunately, these are all the horrible definitions that I had to learn off by heart for the exam, but how we define shock 
is a state of cellular and tissue hypoxia due to either reduced oxygen delivery, so if you've got low blood pressure, Increased oxygen consumption, so maybe you're utilising more than you're providing your cells with, so if you're having seizures, if you've got hypothermia. Um, inadequate oxygen utilisation, so that's quite an interesting one. So that's when really funky things happen, like in sepsis, you get mitochondrial dysfunction. So even if you supply your mitochondria with enough oxygen to use that in that electron transport chain, they're dysfunctional, they can't use it. Cyanide toxicity, really cool. It knocks out one of the cytochromes in the electron transport chain. So you have that brick red appearance because all your sort of blood is like hyper oxygenated, but you just can't utilize it. Um, or a combination of these processes. So the most common cause of shock in like clinical practice that you'll all see is probably going to be hypovolemic shock, and that's mostly going to be due to a reduction in oxygen delivery. Um, when we talk in this um, talk about uh, shock, then it's, it's probably going to be, again, oxygen delivery is going to be reduced because for whatever reason, with respiratory distress, we're not able to oxygenate our red blood cells appropriately. Um, that's not to say you couldn't have a combination of factors. So if you have a dog that's been hit by a car and it's got pulmonary contusions, yes, it might not be oxygenating properly because there's that kind of barrier in the lungs to getting between you know, your alveolar oxygen and your, and your haemoglobin, but they might also be hypovolemic and they might also be anemic. So there's this, it gets easier, I promise. So there's this little um, equation, which I like, and it's something that it's, it's sometimes quite good. You might be thinking, oh, it's not really applicable, but it is, it is useful to think about. So we've got rate of oxygen delivery, because we've said that shock is a problem with oxygen delivery to our tissues. So the rate of oxygen delivery is dependent on a couple of things. So we've got our cardiac output in litres per minute. Um, and then that's going to be due to that's going to be kind of um, related to things like your heart rate and also your stroke volume, um, which are things that we can modulate with drugs. So if you're very bradycardic, for example, you've got an AV block, maybe you need some atropine, etc. Um, if you've got a tachyarrhythmia and your heart's beating too fast and your stroke volume's reduced, you might need some lidocaine. So those are things that we can look at. And also if you've got reduced cardiac contractility, maybe they would do with some pemobendin. And then essentially we've got the amount of haemoglobin the patient has, how saturated that haemoglobin is with oxygen. And then finally, we've got the amount of oxygen that's dissolved in blood. So you can kind of see how all of the, these components can reduce your oxygen delivery to tissues. So if we've got pulmonary distress and we've got um, a patient who's hypoxemic, we're gonna have maybe normal haemoglobin if they're not anemic but it's not going to be fully saturated, so it should be around 97% or above. And then we will also have a low PaO2, which is the oxygen that's free within your plasma. So I think I wanted to just really briefly introduce this because um, so many patients that are critically ill or emergency patients, they don't just have one problem. So if you've got a patient that's got very severe respiratory disease and they're also quite anemic and they've also got an arrhythmia, then actually what you're trying to do is you're trying to increase your DO2. So you're trying to increase how much oxygen all your cells and your tissues are getting. And yes, they might need oxygen therapy, but maybe they also need a blood transfusion and maybe they also need some rate control. So just kind of thinking about with ECC, it's not just like one silver bullet for one thing. It's these tiny little tweaks and adjustments that can make quite a big difference. Um, so yeah, just wanted to go through that. So moving on to a little bit more simple stuff now. Um, so when we have a patient that's presenting to us in respiratory distress, there's a couple of things that we kind of need to think about. So first of all is recognising the dyspnea. I'm really aware that I think I, as a resident, had a bit of a bias when I was busy. Um, and there were lots of cases coming in to just want to say that they were OK so that I could like work on something else. So sometimes you'd have a patient come in that was panting. I'd be like, oh, he's just panting because he's a stress stressy dog or, you know, cat's a bit stressy or whatever. And like a number of occasions I was caught out when you actually put an SpO2 on or you do an arterial blood gas and they're really hypoxemic um, or they've got a pneumo or something. So I think trying to trust that like the client knows their pet the best and if they think there's something wrong, there probably is something wrong. Um, and if a patient presents to you, I would never dismiss panting or an increased respiratory rate and effort as just the patient being anxious, worried, whatever. Um, and I would probably just, at, at the very least, like I'm sure you'll have SpO2 monitors, just pop one on and just check that actually your saturation is okay. Um, 
So remember that when they come to you, your clinical exam is going to be their crisis point normally. Um, you know, their carers might have waited a bit of time before they bring them in. They've had a stressful journey. They're in a new environment. So when you see them, it's going to be the worst that they've been. Um, so provide some anxiolytic um, therapy and oxygen therapy as well. Um, and then just remember that timing is everything. So we'll go through it as we kind of approach different parts of the respiratory system. Um, but in, there's a few circumstances where you have to rush and you've got to intubate urgently, but most of the time taking a bit of a hands-off approach is going to be okay. And we'll kind of go through that in more detail. So when I think about respiratory distress and my approach to the patient, I try to localise where the problem is going to be. So if we're thinking kind of... Um, of the different parts of the respiratory tracts. I wonder if anyone can throw out some of those and like what they are and how you'd split them up. Oh, yeah, which would be part of like upper respiratory tracts. Yeah, cool. Yeah, no, that's good. Yeah. Anything else? Lower respiratory tracts. Yeah, what else have we got? Yeah, sorry, we did say that. You didn't hear for the upper respiratory tract, lower respiratory tracts. Anything else? What was that gone? Plural space, yeah, perfect. Anyone, anything else? So big one would be the pulmonary parenchyma, so the lungs. And then finally, um, extra thoracic structures, which we will go through. So um, I'm going to kind of go through this talk sequentially, um, if that is a word, yeah, um, and start off with um, upper respiratory tract in a moment. Um, so when we're looking at a patient that we think might have respiratory distress, there's a couple of things that we need to evaluate. Um, so I'll just whiz through these very quickly. Um, posture is really important. So how they're standing, how they're comfortable, you know, if they've got their legs adducted, is their neck, you know, they're really orthopnic. The respiratory rate, um, which is something you will know, effort. I don't think I've ever once in my entire life counted a respiratory rate, I have to admit, but you get the impression from just looking at them. Um, but if it's normal, I just write like 24, and if it's not, I just write something higher. Um, and, and it's a bit naughty, but if it's on, you know, you know it if it's high. Um, and uh, the effort of the patient, so, you know, um, how, you know, how much their abdomen's moving and their thorax and things. Um, the respiratory pattern as well so we'll talk about that a little bit later but like especially with central lesions they might have a little bit of an odd respiratory pattern um, so look at that too their mucous membrane color i mean all of you hopefully will know that if a patient is cyanotic that's really crisis point for them that happens with incredibly low so your pao2 which is the amount of oxygen dissolved in your blood should really be um, around sort of like 180 to 100 millimetres of mercury, and that would be considered normal. So you get cyanosis when it's less than 60, which is really very, very low. And I'd be very worried if a patient was cyanotic that they were on the brink of arrest. Um, and then we've got um, their general appearance. So, you know, this little Frenchie with a big bogey poking out of his nose, you know, like I'd be worried they all get regurg and has he got aspiration pneumonia? If you've got a patient with clear fluid or maybe it's like foamy and a little bit pink, you know, have they got some pulmonary edema? Um, if there's quite gross hemorrhage, then, you know, are they coagulopathic? Could there be lungworms? So that kind of thing can give you clues. Um, and then pulse oximetry is really useful. There are a couple of circumstances where it might not be so helpful, but I think um, in general terms, like, it's something that's very accessible to all of you. So I would, I would be using it in any patient that you're a bit worried about with respiratory distress. Um, and then the other thing, I was just a uh, raise of hands, like how many of you have got an uh, ultrasound scanner at your practices? Okay, I think most people, so that's good. Um, I don't think I could do my job without it anymore. Like, it's so helpful. Um, so although our imaging friends might call it hocus pocus, it gives us an awful lot of information. So it's really the extension of a physical exam now for a lot of us that work in critical care. Um, and can be really essential for decision making and, and what you know, path we're going to take um, with our diagnostics and our therapeutic interventions. It improves our patient safety. So, for example, we've had a dog this evening. I don't know if any of you have referred it, actually, but um, hit by a car and has came in, had a pneumo, which was drained at the practice, came back in and you know, we just scanned him. Um, we could see lots of beelines and a bit of pleural effusion and we could see absent glide sign dorsally. So we just put chest strain in. That's it. Like in we put. And, that, and you know, he didn't need to be restrained for radiographs or anything like that. So we could see that his lungs and, um, on one side were worse than the other. So it's really helpful and it means that we don't have to kind of hold them down for x-rays and leave them on, on one side. Um, 
And it's also really useful to help you diagnose, but also to monitor. So if you've got a patient in the hospital that's maybe had a bit of an aspiration event and they're worse and like you've seen them regurg, you wondered if they aspirated, they're a bit tachypnic now, you can scan them and see do they have bee lines and it's really useful. Um, and particularly I think with radiographs, you don't tend to see those pulmonary changes after an aspiration for like maybe even 24, 48 hours. So it can be that you see the bee lines almost pretty immediately. Um, so very useful. For those of you who don't have ultrasound, um, these are really good. They're these little butterfly um, ultrasound things. I don't know if anyone's got them. Um, they're big, they're quite chunky. Like, so for cats, if you're doing like a left atrial check, like, they're a bit difficult. But they're like three or two or three grand. Like, they're not that bad. And you can put them on your phone and they do give really good image quality. So if you're trying to convince your boss to get you one, um, you could put that on your Christmas list or something. So, and they're worthwhile. And they're using them in sort of developing countries and, you know, like out on the, out on the stick where um, people don't have access to medical care so it's great so what was that called? Um, I think they're called it's something butterfly I can find out for you um, does anyone know there's only one on the market butterfly. I think it's, it's butterfly, butterfly something yeah. yeah and they they are a bit they are a bit big but you can still manage them in cats like it's just it's not optimal but I think for what you pay for it it's brilliant so I would say if you can't like haven't got the budget for a big one get that um, and you can get them on eBay I think second hand even or refurbished um, cool, so just briefly, because there's so much, um, you know, that we will be referring back to, so just go through thoracic pocus um, quickly. So is anyone aware of any of the techniques for ultrasounding the thorax, like, that are kind of published? Anyone? You? No? Don't be shy. You know. <laughs> really? Yeah. I think you Yeah, sorry, I was like, you know them all. Um, there's a nine-point one, isn't there, where you do, like, treatment, like, stool feeding. Zagging across, yeah. So the kind of big things that we'd be looking at is your T-FAST, which is, I can't actually remember what it all stands for, thoracic focus assessment of something or other trauma. Um, it doesn't matter, but <laughs> essentially that's really looking for like fluid, um, mostly. Um, and then we've got vet blue, which is like looking a bit more specifically at lungs, um, which I'll show you a picture of in a second. Um, the other thing we can get information of, we've got our cardiologist here, is your left atrium, which is super useful in patients with respiratory distress. And if you're sitting there thinking, oh, I'll never be able to do that, that's absolute rubbish. I can teach a vet student how to do it in five minutes. So you're very welcome to come and visit us in ICU and I'll teach you if you're not sure. Um, it's very simple. Um, we can look at the pericardium, is there a pericardial effusion? And actually you can get a bit of a, um, a sort of a subjective assessment of cardiac contractility and filling. So if I've got a patient who's septic and the blood pressure's tanking, you know, and I've got maybe them on some vasopressors and they've had a fluid bolus, I might look at the heart and, you know, sometimes you see and it's barely contracting and it's really apparent. And then you can say, okay, maybe you need a bit of uh, positive inotropic support. Um, and then we can also maybe have a look at bits in the mediastinum if we're lucky, if there's a mass and things like that. Um, so it's important to say, like in ECC, we're not um, we're not fancy about our scanning. Like you do it in whatever position the patient is happy in. Like you'll kind of look like you're doing twister. Um, and you know we're not getting perfect images. They're a bit scrappy, but they they do the job. Um, so don't get too too hung up on it. Um, yeah, and then this is the vet blue. So we're kind of looking at different points in the lung, um, but the caudal lung, sort of the perihyla region, um, and then sort of more ventrally, and then the cranial lung as well. Um, and I think that, you know, the hope with that is that you're going to catch a pneumothorax up the top. Um, the perihyla region, you might be more likely to see a bit of pulmonary edema. Um, and then sort of more ventral and, and potentially more cranial there, that might be the locations where you ha perhaps pick up a bit of aspiration pneumonia um, as well. <coughs> And then just briefly, just to kind of go through some of the patterns that you might see, and I'll show you some videos as well later. Um, so at the top there, we've got the A lines going across and a glide sign and a nice dry lung. So that's perfect. That's what we want to see. And the gator sign, those are sort of the ribs shadowing down. In the middle here, like D, oh no, B, sorry, we've got some lung rockets, which gives us an indicator of a, um, a wet lung. Sometimes it's really hard if you've got confluent B lines and the whole lung is completely white out to kind of pick those bee lines up because it usually looks like you're shining light through water but if it's all like that it's quite hard to get that contrast so then you have to kind of check all different parts of the lung to get some comparison um, and then we've got a sort of shred sign which is where actually we've lost aeration of the lung and it's really sort of quite dense amounts of fluid in there um, tissue sign fairly similar 
um, the nodule sign, I had, it was really sad actually, we had a lovely flat coat come in the other day and he was off his back legs, again one of you might have referred him, I don't know, um, and when we scanned him straight away he had a little bit of tachypnea, it wasn't really um, saturating, he was saturating okay and lots of nodules like that everywhere and rather than putting him through the MRI scanner we just did a chest x-ray and he had loads of mets. So it is really helpful um, and I wouldn't ever put a dog to sleep based on my assessment of there being lots of nodules but it will help you choose what you do next you know because then maybe if you scan that in your clinic you might say perhaps we're not going to refer this dog we might do an x-ray and then kind of go from there um, so maybe save the client some money um, and then a wedge sign is, is kind of un uncommon um, but you can get that with pulmonary thromboembolisms um, it's important to remember that you're only able to pick up pathology at the periphery of the lung so there is a there's the potential that if there's something a bit more sort of central um, you might not see that with your ultrasound but most things do tend to kind of spread out so yeah um, and then when we're putting the probe on, just to kind of go through why we get A-lines, so A-lines are the nice ones that are horizontal and across, um, essentially um, ultrasound beam is not going to go through air. So these, this is your, um, your lung, and then we've got the circles, which are your alveoli, alveoli sorry, that are filled with air. And then we've got pulmonary parenchymal sort of space, tissue space in between, um, but they're getting reflected back at slightly different angles, so that creates those A-lines. And that would be a normal lung. And then when we've got B lines, essentially what happens is that the interstitial space is thick and that might be because there's fluid in there usually. Um, and so when we then have our ultrasound beam going through, rather than hitting a kind of wall of um, alveoli filled with air, it has bits of sort of tissue and water that it can kind of go through and reverberate back. And that's why you kind of get this artifact of B lines. And hopefully that makes sense. Um, What else have we got here? Oh, yeah, so this is basically when we've got alveolar filling. So if you've got a patient that's maybe got really severe pneumonia or they've got really bad pulmonary contusions, pulmonary hemorrhage, really severe edema, um, pulmonary edema, you start to get lung that looks like tissue and that can be caused hepatization of the lung. And that's when we've got these alveolar completely filled with crap that essentially the ultrasound beam can just go straight through. Um, and so that's why we get like basically lung that looks like a, a liver and a liver obviously doesn't have air in it. So that's how you can make that comparison. Um, and then with alveolar collapse, again, atelectasis, it's a similar sort of appearance. Um, and that might be potentially if you've got um, maybe a lung lobe torsion. So you might have alveoli that are not filled with air. And then you've got, again, a little bit of um, maybe a tiny bit of swelling, but it's more so that the surrounding that, that the alveoli are not filled with air and they're all collapsed. Hope that makes sense. Um, good. And then finally, um, the other really important thing, because I think although this is not a cardiology lecture, it's really useful to talk about um, because we do use it in our diagnostics, is um, your left atrium to aorta check. So that's something that if you've got an ultrasound scan, you, you should really know how to do because it's going to give you a really quick answer in any animal as to why they've got respiratory distress. So you've got a cat that comes in that's got a gallop rhythm. Um, it's got respiratory distress, you put your probe on, you see B lines, you know, two seconds later you've done your left atrium check, it's big, so it's bigger than 1.6, um, and then you know that it's most likely that it's got some form of congestive heart failure and furosemide would be the right treatment for that. And, you know, that can be within three minutes you can get that information and very little um, impact on the patient. And then also, you know, you can see pretty funky stuff like this sometimes on your left atrial check with the lovely little thrombus <laughs> just rolling around in there. Um, so you never know what you'll find with ultrasound. It's really, it's really interesting. Um, one small caveat that I just wanted to mention, which I feel slightly embarrassed now Alton's here, is um, yes, most cats, if they've got um, cardiac disease, are going to probably have a really enlarged left atrium that's kind of obvious to you. Um, but there's a little situation that might um, be worth kind of being aware of. I'm not sure if anybody's heard of this thing called transient myocardial thickening in cats. Basically, um, it's essentially when usually associated with a stressful event and it might be that they've had a catecholamine surge it's why they think some people I think that's right Alton um, you know like if they're an elderly couple and their husband dies or wife dies and then two weeks later they die of heart failure like a broken heart it's kind of that but cats just do it if they go to the dentist you know they're like <laughs> so I don't know why um, so they might present to you with really sudden respiratory distress but 
essentially the, the myocardium is like very thickened and edematous, um, but because it's happened very acutely, they don't have that same left atrial enlargement that a cat that's been developing HCM over some time might have. So in this study, you can kind of see on that graph, hopefully there, um, that with the transient myocardial thickening cats, which are the ones in purple, compared to the HCM cats, the left atrium to aorta ratio was a lot lower. Um, so I think just bear in mind, it probably would be plump, but you know, usually in presentations like this, I would be telling you, you're not looking for subtle things because we're not cardiologists. We're looking for a massive whopping great left atrium for heart failure, but that's not always the case in these patients. So if you ever have any doubt, perhaps just speak to a cardiology team. Um, a lot of them are sort of young cats that have had a recent stressful event um, and they do really well um, and they can have like remodeling over time. We only know it's transient because it kind of reverts back to more or less normal. Um, and I don't know if you want to add anything else in kind of yeah and they do need some fruzamide um for sure um but yeah i think just be aware of, of that just in case you go down a slightly different route with it cool so that is my chat about point of care ultrasound and we're going to go into the respiratory tract now a bit more so with um we kind of split it up so we're going to start with the upper respiratory tract so with upper respiratory tract obstruction um a couple of things to think about is is it an acute deterioration or is it um, of a chronic condition sorry so there aren't that many situations with upper respiratory tract disease when it's something that's happened like super suddenly. Normally they've kind of been like coping with something for a while and then it sort of tips them over the edge. Um, so the kind of um, opposite side of that would be if they've got a very rapid swelling that's causing obstruction um, or if they've got an obstruction maybe secondary to like a foreign object or something like that. Um, so general causes of an upper respiratory tract obstruction, so um, foreign object, a, bo a ball, um, BOAS, which is like the bane of everybody's lives, um, laryngeal paralysis or a mass, but again, even with laryngeal paralysis and, and a mass, like that's been there for a bit of time and then something's caused that to worsen. Um, and then yes, we can see sort of tracheal collapse, tracheal compression, again from a mass, which could be acute onset or more chronic in onset, and actually with trauma, like a tracheal avulsion. So if you ever have a cat that's all sort of crunchy and emphysematous after trauma, then do have like tracheal avulsion on your list if the p lungs are otherwise okay. Um, so here we've got this little cat on the left with the laryngeal mass, a boas dog, and then I think that dog had a melanoma on the top. Um, so how do we diagnose these ones with the upper respir respiratory tract issues? Usually they're quite noisy. Um, you know, it might be stertor, it might be strider. Um, I'm sure you know this, but just to kind of reiterate, so stertor is that like really piggy, phlegmy noise that all your bulldogs make. Um, and then strider typically is more consistent with like laryngeal disease and laryngeal narrowing. And it's the really whistly like <laughs> that kind of thing. Um, and sometimes it's useful to kind of do an impression with the carers and be like, has he been doing this for three weeks? <laughs> and see what they say. Um, so with upper respiratory tract obstruction or, or disease, this is the one where urgent intubation might be required because potentially they've, um, they're at their worst point by the time they get to you after being traveling and things as well. Um, I think hopefully you've all seen these videos on the internet. It's really unlikely that you're gonna see a dog who, um, has had a ball in its throat, usually because they're dead before they get to you, um, sadly. But it has happened. I remember when I worked at Pride, very briefly, someone th was so happy their dog got out of the hospital, threw a ball for it, and it happened in the car park. So then they just like brushed it back in. But basically on the back and then thumbs underneath to pop it forward. Um, I was taught you could use like a corkscrew to like screw it in, but I, I think that's really challenging and I don't I mean maybe you guys have corkscrews in your practice but we don't so just um, just so you know that that's an option for you um, so we've got this animal that's coming in and let's say it doesn't have it doesn't have a ball stuck in its throat it's got a respiratory tract sort of partial obstruction of some description so the first thing we want to do is try and make them relax and give them some oxygen so it's not that they've got a problem getting oxygen into their blood once it's in the lungs but we kind of want to super saturate them so that everything that they are able to get in has got enough oxygen to kind of support them for a while and anxiolysis so it kind of depends on their respiratory like how sort of cardiovascularly stable they are um, so 
in a bulldog, I would normally reach for some butorphanol and I'd probably go pretty like 0.3 mg per kg and I'd give it IM and then between 5 and 10 micrograms per kilogram of ACP and then at the same time I would pop some Emla on their leg, let them chill out, give them some oxygen, um, put fans on them. You know, if you've had a little pom that's had tracheal collapse probably its entire life and suddenly it's worse, like why has that happened? Um, you know, has it got aspiration? Has it got an underlying mitral valve um, disease that now it's in congestive heart failure and it's sort of tipped it over the edge? Um, you know, what's going on with it? And like, you know, that Labrador that's maybe had LARPAR for a while, why is it worse now? Maybe it's regurged and aspirated, it got too hot. Um, so trying to figure out what's been the kind of thing that's tipped them over. Um, I'm sure all of you are very, very used to intubating these guys at the moment. Um, but yeah, just a little sort of, I mean, it's just so bad. I really feel very distressed by it. Um, but we'll kind of talk about how to, um, how to do that as safely as possible. But if you can have chats with your clients about these when they come in, I mean, ideally try to stop them buying them, but if they do, then, um, then I think having that early conversation, because once they get to the point where they're getting sort of laryngeal collapse and vertus acule, then it's, you know, it's a lot harder to kind of get them back um, from that. So early conversations would be good. And then the other thing I just kind of wanted to mention is whenever you have a swelling that's maybe causing, is it, is it yours? Do you recognize it? Oh no, is it? Is that your dog? Oh, is it? Oh no. Can I just say? Yeah. I didn't buy oh no, that's okay. I can't remember what it was. Was it an abscess? Oh, oh, you talking about this dog? Oh, just yeah. a brachy. Yeah. Oh, fine. It's okay if you adopted it. Um, so whenever you have um, a swelling um, that's maybe come up, you know, quite quickly. Um, Obviously, we're worried about a, a, ne a neoplasia potentially, but if it's come up quite suddenly, then just things to consider would be like, is it an abscess? So I would use your ultrasound scanner again, wonderful. Pop it on, see if you can find a pocket of fluid and aspirate. Um, and then we can't say something is septic unless we've seen intracellular bacteria. So have a little look under the microscope. Um, and then the other thing to consider is, has the patient got a coagulopathy? Um, so I remember when I was a vet student, people always said, oh, if they're coagulopathic, don't put net leads on. And I was like, oh God, nothing will happen. It'll be fine. Um, and then <laughs> did have, not I didn't cause it, but did have a um, little Jack Russell that had lung worm, had a neck lead on and had this absolutely enormous hematoma developed to the point that we had to intubate it. Um, so, you know, just be aware of that. And if you've got this mass that's suddenly come up, you know, has it actually got a coagulopathy of some description? It'd be very unusual for that to happen with a primary hemostatic disorder, so platelet issues, but certainly a secondary hemostatic disorder, it definitely could do. Um, so just bear that in mind. Um, and then with our respiratory tra upper respiratory tract obstructions, particularly with these, these chaps, um, we have to prepare to fail. So when we're doing our emergency intubation, we need to have everything ready for it not to work. And this is um, one of the really important bits I want you to take away from this talk is that it is really awful to have respiratory distress and to die from respiratory distress is not how you want your patients to go. So if you have any doubt, you need to just be brave and intubate them, but you want to optimize your chances for success. So we'll kind of talk about how we can do that. So before any like procedure, if you have time, which hopefully you will, start to pre-oxygenate them and attach some monitoring. Make sure everybody knows their roles. So get your ECG on, get some SPO2. If you've got a capnograph, have that ready. Um, and then get the things that you need. So we'll go through that in the next slide. Um, and typically when we induce them, we're gonna do it pretty quickly because we wanna get control of the airway. So it's not like when you're doing like a healthy bitch spay and you're kind of going like slowly, slowly, just get them asleep and then try to intubate. And then we'll plan for a failed intubation as well. So the things I would get ready, um, I would have emergency drugs drawn up if I had a patient that was sitting in oxygen looking like hell and really struggling to breathe. Um, if it was a brachia, I definitely would have some atropine drawn up and some adrenaline. Um, you'll probably have sedated them with some butorphanol, so nothing really that you would want to reverse. And hopefully you've got an IV in because you've given them some time to sort of relax and put some Emla on. You need an Ambu bag, um, oxygen, some ECG pads, and then... Uh, I don't know if you've got those kind of um, stylets that are quite rigid. I find them really difficult to get the ET tube over. So I'll use a dog rigid urine recatheter, but just cut the end off because the number of times I've put that in and then be like, I can't get the end off and it's really frustrating. <laughs> so make sure someone's got some scissors. A selection of ET tubes, 
obviously your laryngoscope suction is so important, especially with these like brachies that just insist on regurging every two minutes. Um, and usually their tongues are like thick and slivery and it's all a nightmare. So get some swabs, get everything you need so you can drag the tongue out, suction everything. Don't be going with a little tiny suction tip, like get a big yanker one if you can, they're brilliant. Um, and then I loop because I don't know why I put that on there. Um, and I think the main thing as well is that thinking about your timings for this. So, you know, there's, there are really awful stories in human medicine where someone's gone in for like a routine procedure and people have been so tunnel visioned about intubating them and they'll be like, oh, I'll get it on the next one, I'll get it on the next one. Before you know it, you know, like five minutes has passed and, and you know, your patient's dead. So I think... Um, it's it's really important to if you've got your nursing team with you or another vet just say like can you alert me if the spo2 starts to drop on this patient more than it has or if i've gone over and set yourself a time period and then know what your backup plan is and that is going to be doing probably well we'll talk about it either a tracheostomy or a, a quick uh, thyroidotomy um so try this but put a time limit on yourself for it and watch the ECG, you know, are they braddying down and things like that. Um, there's nothing really more complex than just trying to get that stylet in there and then feeding your ET tube over it. Just optimise everything you can so you can visualise things um, as best as possible. And then, has anyone ever done an emergency tracheostomy? Oh, you have? Well done. Nightmare. I would not do it. Like, honestly, I think it's very challenging. Um, so, yeah, I think... One of the things, so I'm not going to actually talk to you about this because I think this is too difficult and it's not what they do in people anymore. So an emergency tracheostomy would be, you know, you cut down, you dissect all your tissues away, you get your cartilages, you put through, you know, a little um, incision through there and then you get your suture material, put your tube in and it like it takes time and I don't think many of us would be confident to do that in the short time frame that's required. Um, so we're going to talk instead about what they do in people, which is a cricothyroidotomy. Um, and I think I would just, again, talking about like how quick you need to be with understanding that you need to move on to your next step. So if you're failing to intubate, recognising very rapidly you have to go on to do this. Because, um, you know, it's easy peasy, lemon squeezy to do this when your patient is alive. But difficult, difficult, lemon difficult when they're doing CPR and you're trying to also make an incision and get you know them intubated so and I the only reason I'm a critical care specialist is because I absolutely hated doing bitch phase when I was in practice like there is nothing more terrifying you guys have got like a healthy dog that's young it's got its whole life ahead of it and you're almost gonna like you could kill it whereas this is already pretty much dead and it's very hard to make it worse so like literally that was like my decision making process so think of it like that if you've all done a bitch spay this is not as hard um yeah, so what we're going to do, and there's really good videos on the internet, so essentially you're just going to um, put them on their back, put something underneath, hopefully they've still got a heartbeat and you've just decided I can't intubate you, a nice big incision like this, and then you're just going to feel for that cricothyroid ligament, so underneath that big you can feel your like, I think it's your voice box, I think that's what people call it, but it's your thyroid cartilage, feel under there with your finger, and then you make an incision, and it's all done essentially blind, because as soon as you make that incision you're going to have blood, and then essentially, they say use a bougie. I, I find those really hard to thread an ET tube over. I would just use a rigid um, dog urinary catheter. You'll feel the tracheal rings as you go down and then put your ET tube over it. Um, and then you need to check the correct placement. So either ventilate after inflating it or putting your um, capnograph on. There are really brilliant videos on the internet and they're quite funny because they're in people and it's like Americans, like, you know, military guys. So like you could watch it and see, um, but it is a blind procedure. It's a literal like slash and, and stab situation, um, but that's what you've got to do. Um, so I think you have to be brave and Again, just remember, difficult, difficult, lemon difficult to do it when they're doing CPR on your patient. Cool. There is a little um, paper about doing this in dogs, but um, they've kind of got like more, you know, gelpies and fancy stuff. But um, they, I just thought I'd put it up because they've got a little spay hook that they've used to pull it down. But in all the human um, recommendations, it's essentially just blindly feeling and palpating that cricothyroid cartilage, making a hole. Um, and then just sticking something in that, essentially. So, yeah. Cool. 
So we'll just move on now to the lower respiratory tract, um, which is our next step. Why have I put that? So things that can go wrong here. Feline asthma, and these are all things that are like more acute. Um, so feline asthma, bronchitis, bronchial collapse that's kind of worsened, um, been exacerbated. Eosinophilic bronchopneumopathy. Do you know? Do you guys know what that is? Have you seen that? I always forget about it, and it's it can cause such severe respiratory distress. Um, essentially, it's like a steroid responsive eosinophilic like inflammatory disease in the lungs, and often they'll have really severe coughing, like very productive. It might, it kind of looks a bit like kennel cough, um, and they can be massively hypoxemic, even require ventilation. And sometimes when you do the, the radiographs, they've got big sort of lesions everywhere, almost it's like masses and, and mets. Um, potentially a foreign body, uh, you know, a bit less likely. And then a lung lobe torsion, like pugs are our little poster children for that. Um, it doesn't tend to cause like super severe respiratory distress, a lung lobe torsion, like it, it does a bit. Um, but one of the things that can happen is that if you think about your lung lobe when it twists, um, so what you're going to get is your strong arterial blood supply will push blood into that twist and tors lung, but the venous supply will be sort of collapsed. So then you start to get this kind of like filling and um, sort of, essentially like sort of I don't know, exudational diapodesis of blood into the thorax so although like just losing one lung lobe is not the end of the world because actually you can resect like a couple of lung lobes um you could then start to also see um sort of a pleural effusion developing that's more hemorrhagic in nature um so i think just kind of bear that in mind if you've got a little pug and what would that look like on our scan when we pocus them so you would see the tissue sign right because there'd be no air in that lung it would all be sort of collapsed out you see you might see a tissue sign of just one area of lung um, and you'd also maybe have a pleural effusion as well which if you tapped it, it would be a bit hemor hemorrhagic in nature um, so this sort of diagnosis of a lower respiratory tract obstruction um, so hopefully you're not going to hear that kind of upper noise that's we that's really um classic for the upper respiratory tract obstruction, although you might, when you auscultate them, hear a bit of a wheeze. Um, they might have a chronic history of coughing, so it's important to get that history. Um, a bit of an expiratory push as well. Um, so I think when you, um, when you breathe in, you're kind of like using a lot of muscles to kind of pull your, and, and sort of stent your airways open and your bronchi open, they're being pulled apart. Mm -hmm. And when you expire, that kind of gets collapsed in. So if you've already got some narrowing or inflammation in your airways at, on expiration, it's gonna be really difficult to push things through. Um, so that expiratory phase will be like prolonged. Um, severe asthma, if you take some radiographs, you might also see some uh, right middle lung lobe collapse. So um, and you might also find that on, on your POCUS scan. There'll be hyperinflation of the lungs and then hypercapnia. I don't know if many of you have blood gas analysis, even if you do any of you. Have, yeah, great. So you can look for hypercapnia as well um, and see if that's present. Um, so how do we stabilise these patients? So sedation. Um, I really have like, I think cats, when they've got asthma, um, they're so anxious that not a lot helps them. So you might, if they are cardiovascularly stable, consider a very, very low dose of dexmedetomidine. You guys are probably like shocked by the low doses we use here. Like one to two micrograms per kilogram is like my max dose that I've ever used. So probably that. Some oxygen therapy. Um, and then a beta-2 agonist. So to try to kind of dilate those bronchioles. Um, and then potentially there are a couple of other things that can also help with bronchodilation. So ketamine actually in people that have got asthma, um, you know, if they're put on mechanical ventilation, they'll have ketamine infusion, magnesium and methylxanthine, which is like one of the ingredients in coffee, coffee and, and tea and caffeine, which you won't have unless, I mean, maybe you could put an NG tube, give them a shot of coffee, but I probably wouldn't. Um, but, you know, if you're inducing a cat, then you might go ketamine midazolam rather than a different choice because you know that that's going to give you a bit of bronchodilation as well. Um, and if they're really struggling, then, then again, intubate them. Don't be shy about doing that. Um, so I don't have time to talk about all the different ways we can deliver oxygen therapy, but I think just remember that, yes, you guys might not have high flow nasal oxygen or mechanical ventilation, so your options are a bit more limited to either sort of flow by an oxygen kennel or cannulae. Um, but if your patient's really struggling, like don't let them suffer, like, you know, give them a bit of station to calm them down, intubate them and then just put your whatever like tubing like into your ET tube, make sure there's still space for them to expire their CO2 and then you're kind of delivering like 100% oxygen into their lungs and you can do IPPV and that might just be enough until you can get things under control, you can do a bit of inhaled bronchodilators and, and things like that. So yes, it might not be 
that you're going to completely reverse their respiratory disease, but you can probably get them into a better situation and wake them up calmly um, and let them kind of have a bit of a rest as well. Um, and then we've got our pulmonary parenchymal disease, which is the sort of next way step down. And that's um, actually, I'm going to ask you, so that's quite a few things. So yeah, do you want to shout, anyone want to shout out a couple of things that could be going on with, with the lungs? Edema, yep, perfect. So we could have that for different reasons. Anybody, do you, you know the different reasons, yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. Anyone else got any other ones? You must know. I'm sure you do. I won't put you on the spot. Um, so we can have a couple of different things. So we can have edema, which is true, but there can be different causes of edema. So we can have cardiogenic pulmonary edema, so edema that's kind of happened because um, essentially you've got an increased left atrial pressure. So there's an inability for sort of uh, blood to get from the lungs into the heart, and there's a bit of a backup and you get an increased hydrostatic pressure. So that could be HCM, DCM, aortic stenosis, a PDA, potentially transient myocardial thickening that we spoke about as well in cats. Um, and then non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. So that's anything that's really not, um, like not caused by the heart. So that could be because you've got something that's caused your vessels to be leaky in the lungs. Um, and that can be when we've got acute respiratory distress syndrome because of a lot of inflammation. Um, strangulation, choking, electrocution, and also post-obstruction. So actually, any puppy, I've seen it quite a few times in puppies, um, that presents you with severe onset acute respiratory distress and you scan them and their lungs are white everywhere, beelines everywhere. You know, if it's in the dorsal lung fields, then I'd be like, oh, it doesn't really seem like you've aspirated and you've got a normal temperature or maybe it's a bit low. Um, you haven't got a massive neutrophilia. There's no history of regurg and vomiting. Um, you know, I would be thinking, have they choked on something? Um, you know, has someone pulled them on the lead or have they got look on their tongues and see if there's any burn marks? They could have electrocuted themselves. Um, or prolonged seizures, actually. I don't think I put that on there. No, I didn't. Um, and then post-obstruction. So, you know, if you can imagine a BOAS patient that's really been struggling for a long time with their breathing and, you know, they're choked up here and the amount of effort they're having to put in to drag air into their lungs that's going to also have the same effect in, in sort of the vasculature and the capillaries and essentially just pull fluid out into the parenchyma um, and also um, essentially cause edema. Um, so that's another reason with these birth patients. Like sometimes when I do speak to referring vets and they're like, oh, you know, I'm not sure about this dog, what I should do. And I can hear it in the background, like, <laughs> and I'm like, you should intubate it. That sounds awful. Um, so don't be shy of doing that. Like just get their breathing under control because... They might be coping now, but they're kind of setting themselves up for non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. And also they're filling their, their, um, their stomachs with air. They're more likely to regurge and aspirate. So you, you're better off just trying to get the situation controlled. Um, infectious causes, so we can have bacterial pneumonias, viral pneumonias, parasitic infections, lungworm is really important to consider. Um, and then also inflammatory. So that's our usually like eosinophilic bronchoneuropathy. And, and um, we do see that quite a bit actually. Um, Hemorrhage can cause pulmonary parenchymal disease, like our little friend downstairs with um, some contusions, and coagulopathy, which you know can be any coagulopathy. So it could be primary hemostatic disorder, so an ITP patient, um, but it could be related to lungworm as well. It could be rodenticide intoxication. So kind of keeping that on the list. Um, and then sometimes we can see patients with such severe neoplasia and metastasis that they've actually become very dyspneic. Um, so, you know, you might see nodules and, and you will certainly pick that up on the x-rays. Um, and then pulmonary thromboembolism as well. Um, it would be an unlikely thing to happen, um, but certainly we can see it. And that would be really hard. It's hard for us to diagnose. It'd be hard for you guys to diagnose. But if you've got a patient that's maybe got Cushing's or a hypercoagulable disease and they've got sudden onset respiratory distress and you can't really find a reason for it, it's something to consider, certainly. Um, so how do we reckon, recognise pulmonary parenchymal disease? Well, we've kind of got a bit of a capsule history, um, so very brief. Um, we are looking at the patient and they don't have that kind of noisy strider or stertor. They don't really have that expiratory push that we would maybe associate with upper and lower respiratory tract disease. We can't hear any wheezes. Um, but we might have a sort of tachypnea that's kind of quite shallow and rapid. Um, and harsh lung sounds or crackles potentially. We've done a thoracic pocus scan and we can see bee lines like this or shred. 
Um, and then we're kind of looking at things like the, the signalment, the history, clinical exam and other diagnostics as well to kind of see if any of these other things might fit. Um, and, you know, make sure you do check lungworm and, you know, you can do a rectal exam for that too. Um, in, in dogs, usually if they've got cardiac disease, um, very conscious to have a cardiologist standing right there, but we'll normally have a murmur. Um, and in cats, we don't always have a murmur, but we typically will hear a gallop rhythm. And Alton, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, does anyone know why you have a gallop rhythm? I don't know what heart sound is, and I don't think it matters to me personally, but does anyone know why a gallop happens? What, what that noise is? Because we all know that like with the murmurs, it's kind of like the turbulent blood through like a valve that's not kind of closing in time. But I hope this is right, but this is how I kind of think of a gallop is, and why we don't get it in dogs, is that if I got a small cup of water and I threw it against a wall and, the ma and a mattress was against the wall, it wouldn't really make a sound. But if I got a big bucket of water and threw it against a concrete wall, it would make a big noise. And so the type of heart disease that cats get is that they get a very stiff hypertrophic left ventricle. Um, and dogs don't tend to get like ventricular hypertrophy. And then they get this big dilated left atrium. So essentially what the third heart sound is, the gallop, is this huge volume of blood sloshing down and hitting that rigid left ventricular wall. So given that the majority of cats as they kind of get older and they develop heart disease are probably going to be more H, like a HCM type situation, then if you hear a gallop rhythm, then that can be a real warning sign to you to have a think about, OK, I need to do my left atrial check. Um, hopefully that kind of makes rough sense. But yeah, cool. Um, and then how do we stabilise these patients that um, have got pulmonary parenchymal disease? So it kind of really depends on your diagnosis. And, and usually sedation and oxygen therapy is never going to be wrong. This really sad little bulldog because he can't even breathe. Um, but, you know, if you've got beelines everywhere, you've got that whopping left atrium down there, you're going to be giving them some fruzamide. Um, if you've got a suspicion that they've maybe got um, a pneumonia, like an aspiration pneumonia, so... Again, that will be like your signalments, the location of your beelines and your shred. Um, so usually like more ventral history of regurge vomiting, con you know, consistent with the breed. They might be pyrexic, although do you remember if they're a bit shocky, maybe they won't be. Um, and then a blood smear, like, you know, I, I'm sure you guys have got crappy microscopes because I remember I did when I was in practice. But try and do a blood smear or even just, you know, to try and see have you got a neutrophilia and things. So early antibiotics, IV antibiotics for that. You don't need to really go anything bigger than just a moxipav, that's fine, IV every, every eight hours. If they've had a recent history of a beta-lactam antibiotic in the last three months, then they may have a resistant infection, in which case you might want to go with, you know, a bit more sort of a, a different coverage, like perhaps a fluoroquinolone plus clindamycin. Um, if they've got a coagulopathy, so you think that there's hemorrhage going on there, um, there's not an awful lot we can do about platelets, but we can certainly give vitamin K and we can give fresh frozen plasma to try to uh, treat the coagulopathy. And then if you've got lungworm, you're just going to give them fenbendazole as well. Um, and again, remember that, you know, if you're doing everything you possibly can to treat your patients, but they're still hypoxemic, then you may have to intubate them and, and refer them intubated with oxygen or try to get them to the nearest referral centre because you might have to escalate to either high flow or to mechanical ventilation. Um, and then just a couple more um, bits to go through. So the final one is our pleural space disease. Um, so lots of different reasons why we can have pleural space disease. We can have hemorrhage. Again, it's kind of like the similar themes. Uh, a septic exudate is possible. Um, also non-septic exudate, so FIP, and even pancreatitis can cause a lot of inflammation and cause um, a, an exudate in the chest. Chyle, cardiac disease, lung lobe torsion. Urothorax, um, so not common, but you know, bladder rupture and um, combined with a diaphragmatic rupture, you can have a urothorax as well. Um, Neoplastic effusions um, and also a uh, neoplasia in itself, like space occupying. I don't know why I've only put lymphoma, you can get other things, but a mass. Um, traumatic or a spontaneous pneumothorax. So always remember you can get spontaneous pneumothoraxes, which is highly stressful um, because nobody ever thinks of them, including me, but they happen. Um, and then diaphragmatic rupture leading to you having uh, uh, organs in your thorax as well. So how will we know that we've got pleural space disease? So we've kind of ruled out maybe upper respiratory tract, lower respiratory tract based on history, physical exam, and you know, our, our findings. We've done some point of care ultrasound um, as well, and we've gained a bit more information. So they might have tachypnea with a restrictive pattern, so they can't really move their chest very well. Um, 
dull lung and heart sounds um, usually more ventrally sometimes I've heard gut sounds when I'm oscill chasing the chest and then that's kind of a bit of a slam dunk but then you need to confirm with x-rays um, and then you know thoracic ultrasound like I don't know how to manage without it now but you know pleural effusion absent glide sign if they've got a pneumo a mass and maybe you might even see abdominal viscera um, be a bit careful because you can, when you scan the, I'm sure some of you are very competent with ultrasound, but you, know, you can get that reflection of the, of the liver across the diaphragm when you're scanning. So just be a bit cautious with that. Um, but yeah, typically ultrasound can be used for sort of identifying, you know, stomach next to, next to heart. Um, and then pneumothorax is a bit of a tricky one. So this is a little video here of a pneumo. So essentially we've got the top section here is all of your sort of soft tissue and then that bright white line is your, your kind of, um, so it's the pleural um, and um, parietal sort of, oh hello, what? Oh, what did you say Alfie? Oh, glycine, yeah. So it's, um, it's the kind of the edge of your lung and your, and your sort of pleurals. What is it? Pleura. Yeah, it's just your pleura. Um, and really what we're looking for is movement there. But you can see how it's moving back and forth, right? So that's not the glide sign. And that's where people get a bit mixed up. So the next slide I can show you is your glide sign. So it's that rolling appearance that you want to see. OK, so you have to really zoom in and get your eye in. So don't be if it's just moving back and forth, don't be like conned. That is not a glide sign. Zoom in and try and see if you can see rolling. And I always think it looks like waves crashing along a shore, like that kind of movement um, there. So that's a glide. If you're ever in doubt um, and the patient's very dyspneic, you can just do a thoracosynthesis. That's fine. Um, I wouldn't necessarily x-ray them. If they've had a trauma and you're you know, quite concerned about a pneumothorax, then just do a little diagnostic tap um, to find out. So, can you see pulmonary B lines if you've got a pneumothorax? No, exactly, you can't. Yeah, so that's another thing that's helpful. So, if you've got, um, so this is our chest wall here, if you've got air, remember that air just reflects back your ultrasound beam, so you're just going to see a white line and you're not going to see any of the pathology underneath. So, all that is to say, if you can see B lines everywhere or a shred sign, you don't have a pneumothorax in that location. So it's quite nice to reassure yourself with. And then the other thing you can do if you're not sure if you've got a pneumothorax or not is you can use your M mode, which is you just press it on your ultrasound and line it up along the lung. Um, and essentially with a normal lung, when you've got movement of your lung against your pleura, you'll have a barcode on the top and then this kind of, I don't think it looks like a beach, but it's a bit speckledy. Um, along the bottom and then when you've got a pneumo it just the whole thing looks like a barcode so it's useful to try and do that in your clinic now with normal patients and you can also like really easily compare different points on the same patient or you can compare your patient that you think has a pneumo with a normal one and it helps you kind of figure it out um, if I was really worried I would do a diagnostic thoracosynthesis before I went ahead and did an x-ray because um, I just think I don't like leaving patients on a table on lateral recumbency when they might have something quite wrong with them. Um, cool. And then the other thing to kind of remember about pleural space disease is that sometimes it, there can be a little ticking time bomb um, going on. So make sure that if you've had a patient that's had a trauma that you do at some point once they're a bit more stable, even if you feel like, oh, you're OK, um, just get a lateral radiograph to confirm that you're not going to send them home with a diaphragmatic rupture. And also this little cat had really cool, I think you can see it. We were like, is it a pneumo? But it's not. It was this bleb um, and it was massive. Um, and it just had a really thin, where is it, a bit of um, this, like a bit of, there it is. You see that massive bleb. Um, and I guess like at any point that could have just ruptured and then the cat would have had a really big um, spontaneous potentially tension pneumothorax. So at some point in all your trauma patients do get a little x-ray before they go home. Make sure you're not sending them home with anything. Um, and then if we need to do thoracic, uh, thoracosynthesis, um, then this is kind of like my drugs of choice. So for a cat, maybe some methadone. Um, I really like midazolam and ketamine. I, I just think um, it gives you like 20 minutes of good sedation, which is enough to get that done. Um, and it's sort of cardiovascularly fairly um, safe. And then dogs, butorphanol or methadone if they're painful. And then a very, very small dose of metatomidine if needed. And you can always put a little local anaesthetic if, if you're worried. Um, I did some volunteering in the Cook Islands and I'm, 
like I'm not lying, that was their syringes. And it was like a propofol needle and syringe for every patient. That's all they had. And they were all fine, those dogs. They, they like had the immune systems of like a champion. Um, yeah, and so we're going to have all these things set up when we need to do thoracosynthesis. We're going to go the ventral thorax if it's going to be likely to be a fluid or sort of the, the sort of more dorsal thorax if it might be a pneumo. Um, seventh to eighth intercostal space. Just have everything you need. Um, if you've got a really, really fat, big dog, um, a butterfly catheter is not going to work. So you just get your normal IV catheter stylet and just use that. Um, and then, yeah, just make sure you have everything ready. You need to keep some samples um, and be ready to intubate this patient if you need to. Make sure they've got oxygen as well. Um, if you're going to place a chest strain because maybe you've had um, repeat... Well, actually, I'm going to tell you, I won't make you say. But if you've got a pyothorax, you need to do lavage. You've got a continuous pneumothorax, like this little dog downstairs, we've put a chest drain in because we've had to drain twice now, or a neoplastic effusion that's maybe ongoing. Um, then I think if they've got severe respiratory distress, I will normally just do like a little tap, get rid of some fluid, some air, whatever, make them more stable before I spend time faffing about with this. So, you know, if you think this is going to take you a little bit longer, then perhaps do that. Um, and then just be really careful to prevent patient interference and make sure that your nurses are comfortable with how to use a chest strain because, you know, potentially they could chew on that and then make themselves a lot worse. Um, if anyone's not sure how to use, do the Seldinger technique as well, like um, there's lots of really good videos online. So it, it's, not, it's not too tricky and the myelocasters are great. Um, and then treatment of, of pleural space disease, again, it depends on what you've got, but antibiotics and lavage, if you've got... Um, uh, hemorrhagic effusion, fresh frozen plasma or tranexamic acid potentially as well. Um, and then pleurodesis, which I'll tell you about in just a moment. Um, they might need advanced imaging. So if you've got a spaniel that's been running through the fields and has now got a pyothorax, it's probably got a grass seed somewhere. Um, you know, maybe they would need chemotherapy if there's a, a neoplastic thing or, or surgery. And cats as well with heart disease do tend to get um, pleural effusions, so they would normally have a large left atrium, so you could potentially look at referral for that if you wanted to, or furosemide. Um, and then just to mention briefly pleurodesis, so if you've got a patient who has got a recurrent pneumothorax um, and they don't have money for CT or referral, and you don't feel comfortable doing a uh, thoracostomy, which is fair enough, I wouldn't, um, then there is some reports of essentially just taking out the patient's blood and it's all sort of um, done under aseptic conditions um, and, then re and then putting it back into, into their thorax. And essentially it kind of provides clotting factors um, and platelets and the hope is it creates a little patch over the area that's leaking if it's traumatic. Um, and actually, they've had quite a lot of success doing this. Um, you know, it's not... I, would, I wouldn't jump to do it quickly. I think if you've had a patient you're managing with a chest strain for a couple of days or, you know, four or five days, and it's just the volumes are not even decreasing, they can't afford referral for CT, then that's something you can consider um, as a sort of do-or-die situation. Yeah. Um, and then finally, sorry, I'm overrun a bit... Um, We've just got the last one, which is your extrathoracic disease. So we've done upper respiratory tract, lower respiratory tract, pulmonary parenchyma, pleural space, and now extrathoracic. So this just really covers like your respiratory apparatus, essentially. So how do we know when our um, dyspnea or sort of hypoxemia, essentially, is due to extrathoracic disease? Well, they'll be tachypnic. Um, but usually they'll have reduced chest wall excursions um, and they'll be hypoxemic, but with a elevated CO2. So normally with extrathoracic disease, like the reason you're hypoxemic is because you're just not doing gas exchange effectively. So your alveoli are, are filled with gas, but the gas that they're filled with is the CO2 and you're not exchanging that. Your tidal volume is not sufficient to provide you with fresh oxygen and get rid of the CO2 that you're producing. So why might that happen? So trauma, um, rib fractures are really painful. And uh, obviously I did have to ventilate a cat once because despite like really good analgesia, it was just so painful. It was just barely taking any breaths because it was, in, you know, had such severe chest trauma. Um, subcutaneous emphysema that's kind of compressing your chest. Um, and potentially as well, abdominal wall rupture, um, which I'll show you a picture of. But I also had a little puppy once, had abdominal wall rupture. That was all fine. We we're going to do a planned surgery the next day. 
and then out of nowhere its guts like migrated up the side of its body and like compressed its chest so we it, like couldn't breathe so we had to sort of pull them back out quickly so that was a weird one um, and then neurological so if you're not using your respiratory apparatus appropriately so that could be um, centrally mediated so maybe you know your medulla is going to tell you when to breathe how long to breathe for and it's going to be in charge of all of that so if you've got a central lesion that might not be occurring properly and then remember that uh, sort of your cervical spinal cord um, the the nerves that innovate your your diaphragm um, come from c3 4 and 5 so always remember 3 4 and 5 keeps the diaphragm alive um, and essentially that's going to innovate your diaphragm and, and help you to breathe and then we can also have a peripheral issue so if you've got neuromuscular disease so that might be things like botulism for example as well um, So yeah, the vagus kind of in, the vagus nerve um, comes from like C three, four, and five, and innervates diaphragm. This is a little friend, Diggory. I'm sure you guys have heard about him. We love him. Um, but he ran into a water trough and broke his neck, and um, basically presented to us and you know really reduced respiratory excursion. CO two incredibly high. Had to be on the ventilator for a while. Um, he got a tracheostomy, and we helped him breathe through that. And he's doing really great now. Um, I think he wouldn't be if he was anywhere else because. Uh, I think Shailen was very generous with the pricing on that one. But, um, oh yeah, sorry, phrenic nerve, not vagus, I'm tired. Um, phrenic nerve will innovate your diaphragm. And then these are just some radiographs just to kind of show you when you've got um, abdominal organs that are kind of out where they should be. If they go up the sort of towards your thorax, that could cause compression. And then there's a little cat there with some nasty rib fractures as well. Um, so being aware of that. And then just a couple of videos to finish with. So we've got this little chappy. So pretty nasty, really painful. Um, he did a little bit better after he'd had some analgesia, but essentially when he came in was like barely moving his chest um, and um, CO2 was quite high. And I think the SPO2 was a little bit low on that one as well. And then this dog, I think this one had, um, I think this one had like a polyneuropathy, but I can't remember if it was polyradicular neuritis or not. Um, but if you can see, can you see in the top, like he's got this fish mouth, like gaspy expression, and then the chest wall was barely moving. Um, so I think that's something to kind of be aware of in your patients. Like, yeah, he's not tachypnic necessarily, like he's got a little bit of an increased respiratory rate, um, but it's all sort of, he had a very anxious expression um, and wasn't moving the chest wall enough and his CO2 was very high as well. Um, so it's not, it's not always simple, essentially. So what would we do if we had a patient that had extrathoracic um, disease causing hypoxemia? Um, so pain relief if required, but being aware that potentially that could also depress your respiratory drive a little bit, so you might have to watch that. Um, so yeah, if you've got a patient that's got neurological hypoventilation, then you know, avoiding um, anything that would cause excessive sedation. Um, so, you know, obviously you need to give pain relief if they've broken the neck, but I think just kind of being a bit cautious about that and trying to titrate things and maybe not going so heavy on your opioids, but doing a bit of multimodal analgesia, a bit of ketamine or paracetamol if it's dog and it's appropriate. Oxygen therapy, because we're trying to flush out all that CO2 that's accumulated in that alveoli. And then, you know, they may require surgery. And then finally, intubation and maybe mechanical ventilation. So if you ever need to refer a patient to us, um, just give us a call, like get them intubated and settled. But we could do probably like Teva um, on the way here and you could be, you know, intubated and, and bagging them in the back and things and, and we'll be ready to get them when they're here. Um, but yeah, I think that's that's all. Sorry, I've gone over by 10 minutes, but this is the best dog that ever lived. It's my flat coat. I lost him this year and he got to 15 and he was an absolute legend. I know he was a babe. Um, but yeah, are there any questions? Sorry, it's a bit of a whiz through.